thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here. I feel rather humble, actually, in terms of talking to you about a subject that I've probably spent a sort of lifetime both experiencing and researching. And you may ask, well, why am I here? Um, well, one of the reasons is, as a civil engineer, that in the last seven years, I work for Arup, who are a great company represented here in Dublin. And I led their global planning business. So I moved from delivering major infrastructure into planning because I thought in planning, actually, we can organize things in a way to improve collaborative outcomes, which might be better. I had about eight or 900 people working for me all over the world at the cutting edge of low carbon uh, city development, of low carbon energy, water, waste management. And the conclusion I came to was that all over the world, the private sector is trying to make changes happen, as you've been discussing here, in terms of what I might call marginal changes, 10, 20, 30 percent changes in performance. But actually, what the world needs is a factor four change in performance. And the reason I know that is, as I was working for Arup, I was invited by the Institution of Civil Engineers to do a global lecture tour on a subject that I could choose. And I chose to analyze with a researcher how nine billion people could live sustainably on the planet in 2050 and what investments and policies would be required to get there. So I then did that analysis, concluded that transformational change was needed from the essential economic model the world is using, which is digging up resources, processing them through infrastructure and, and human activity, and then basically throwing away the waste that arises and polluting the planet. And that, of course, includes CO2 emissions polluting the air. And we've got to change that model into one where we manage resources in closed loops and we use less resources and we dig up less and we close loops and operate much more efficiently, which is rather good because actually you spend less money on stuff and you end up with higher value services. So how on earth do we make that transformation happen? And so everywhere I went, I saw that people could see this vision. And indeed, the, they could see the vision of how to finance it, because pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, multinational banks around the world have got money they want to put into projects rather than to put into real estate and shares, which are currently so volatile that it's a big problem. But they can't find the projects. They can't find the projects at scale, which will deliver a return. But through resource efficiency, particularly if it's aggregated at a regional scale, you can actually get the scale of projects and the returns out of the savings that arise to actually draw financing into that sort of proposition. So everywhere I went, the public and private sector could sort of glimpse that opportunity but didn't know how on earth to get there. So in 2011, uh, through a process I won't bore you with, but it was, a, it was one moment at a particular conference in Hong Kong where I was challenged. I was challenging people on the platform. Why aren't you doing something about this? And somebody turned around to me and said, why don't you do it? <laughs> so I thought, my God, you know, maybe I should because I had a fairly deep connection into China, a deep connection into India, and a deep connection into Africa and Europe. And so I decided to set up a charity to step into that space with world-leading people in most disciplines and try and see transformational change. Now, if, though, if some of you here aren't convinced that the resource uh, shortages are a problem, let me give you one statistic from China. China's urbanization is the greatest change in resource management the world has ever seen by a factor of 50 or so. And it means that China's urbanization, construction, increased food consumption, increased energy consumption requires an increase of land to support that process of around 4% a year in terms of what we call ecological footprint. That's the amount of land you need to provide energy services, to provide water, to provide raw materials, and to absorb waste. That's growing at 4% a year because of urbanization. Doesn't sound much, does it? 4% times 1.3 billion people times 2.3 hectares of land for every person in China is 100 million hectares of land China has to find new every year to support 
that process of urbanization. That's twice the size of France. So basically, China is out in the outside world looking for areas of land, for food growing, for resources, twice the size of France every year to support that model of economic growth. China has seen the fact that this is unsustainable and is desperately trying to change direction. India has seen that China is struggling and has begun to recognize there might be an alternative leapfrog possibility. And all of us are seeing inflation of, of uh, fossil fuel prices, of raw materials, of food, which we can no longer control because these things are happening because of this massive explosion of resource consumption elsewhere. And at the same time, in Europe, we've now mortgaged ourselves by our prolific investment in things we perhaps didn't need at the time, but we thought would be good investments for the future. We borrowed money and mortgaged ourselves against a future of increasing resource exploitation, which is the only way that GDP grows. And of course, Europe doesn't have the resources to be able to recover that debt. America does, because America has a low population density and has masses of resources, you know, like the fracking gas and so on, that it will be able to draw back in to recover the debt. But Europe doesn't have that, because our population density is much higher, similar to China, similar to India. So Europe uh, and China and India are in a box together, in a sense, of trying to tackle this problem, which requires a change of direction. And increasingly, we're calling it the circular economy. This is essentially an economy where we actually use and reuse materials. We design products so they can be recycled and reuse. Uh, that process driven by renewable energy rather than by fossil fuel energy, where we move to dramatically reduce oil imports, which of course is a big issue in Ireland, by, by using different modes of transport particularly, and, and so on and so forth. You know many of those things uh, as I do. There is a wonderful report on this that was produced by McKinsey in January this year, if you want to look it up, on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation website that I'm an advisory member of. There's a very, very good report there on the circular economy which describes the opportunity for business in Europe to actually follow this route. Now, for you as a business, what this primarily means is a transition from selling products to selling services. That is actually a very profound opportunity because products are obviously, their price is very much affected by raw material prices and therefore your tight margins of selling those products in the market are, are affected all the time by, by the volatility of resource prices. But if you get involved in selling the service that those products provide to people, then your margins can be higher and more stable. And we then come to the, the customer. Do customers want to start buying services instead of buying products? And that is a big question that everybody's asking, but the research that's currently being done is that 20 to 25 year olds all over the world are seeing these problems and saying, actually, I'd rather buy shared services. I'd rather lease things. I'd rather just buy, you know, lease something when I need it. And, and I'm very happy to, for my young baby to, to, to buy stuff on eBay that's recycled from other people rather than buying new products and so on. So this is actually beginning to happen in a very strong way. So for you as businesses, one of the strategies is to look into the future and say, is it possible to move my business model into um, selling services? If you do that, you'll almost immediately conclude you can't do that on your own. You have to do it in collaboration with other businesses and uh, I'm very struck by a number of uh, Scandinavian and, and Dutch companies that are realizing that instead of selling uh, smart widgets to put into buildings, they should get involved in partnering with the construction and delivery of buildings to provide buildings that provide much better service to clients and get a return out of the long-term uh, operation. So we're talking about a private finance initiative model, a BOT model of aggregating up a number of different products into services. So, so let me come to Ireland, and your business is operating in Ireland. I know some of you are international, but what does Ireland have that, that is particularly relevant to this issue? Well, one is you have a very low population density and a very large agricultural um, activity, and 
one of the things that that provides you is an opportunity to have a lot more resources in this new way of thinking than other countries in Europe. So in my view, Ireland would be the country in Europe that could really demonstrate how to develop a circular economy uh, and to do that by driving resource consumption down, by innovating in products, by bringing in much more renewable energy to attract companies that want to drive the remanufacturing process through renewable energy. And in that process, establish new business models you can take into the rest of Europe. Because for sure, and the McKinsey report says this, the only way Europe can genuinely recover from this level of debt is to move to a circular economy rather than try and increase GDP using the old industrial form of, of thinking. The second thing you have is a lot of opportunity for renewable energy. And Scotland, of course, is pursuing the same strategy. And I've talked to the First Minister in Scotland and said, don't sell your renewable energy to other countries if you've got an excess of it. I'm not sure that's possible in Ireland, but maybe it's possible. Keep it in, in Ireland and attract new manufacturing businesses to use that renewable energy, a bit like Iceland is doing with data centers and so on. Um, the other opportunity I think there is, is to establish through social enterprises a new way of collaborative working between government, business and communities. So I'm very excited about the, the business in community uh, in Ireland organization and the opportunity maybe to help you establish some sort of collaborative uh, opportunity to try and target a circular economy model in Ireland, which I think might be a logical next step for you to start exploring and, and start talking to government. What I am, have done is actually said that metrics are key to it. So I agree with everything that Tina and others have said, that in the end, metrics are important. And the final point I want to make is that this is a unique moment in human history. We have never had the opportunity to measure and create models of human activity, resource flows, natural systems, and connect it to models of changing climate in a way that regions can begin to look at the whole basket of human activity and natural systems and actually in real time start to monitor that and look for the opportunities to aggregate and improve resource efficiency. This is now possible. So in my new charity, we're developing an open source tool that every region of the world will be able to use to link resource systems and human activity to economics. And it is extraordinary that we've got to this stage of human development without a formal way of linking economic value in society to resource systems. No economic models currently do that. And I think this is the moment we need that. So we're going to create this model. We're going to put it into certain regions of the world and try and demonstrate that profound transformative change is possible by, by connecting up the, the, the opportunities for investment in gas networks, in water networks, in waste management and construction and development. So actually that total integrated system can provide a much more efficient and much lower cost system for society than is possible at the moment and deliver a factor four transformation by 2050, which is what current metrics would require. I think the access to capital to drive this is there and uh, there's an organization called the B20, which sits under the World Economic Forum, where pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and multinational banks are working together to create new innovative financing models. And so it is possible to draw in finance, I think, at regional scale, even maybe at an Irish scale, if the governance and long-term metrics are in place to monitor and deliver long-term improved performance. So I'd like to finish by congratulating um, BITC on, on, on your wonderful um, work and, and congratulate you as companies for the clear leadership you're demonstrating and of course congratulate those new uh, receivers of the, uh, of the mark uh, on, on what I know is a very difficult road. Uh, we've been struggling, we were struggling with this in Arup, we have now got an environmental management system uh, but it was a struggle to put it in place and getting the metrics and, and working at these things I know is very difficult. Uh, and I hope maybe we can keep talking to each other about the possibilities of helping you to develop this broader approach to the circular economy in Ireland. So thank you. <laughs>